Okay, I think we're going to get started here. I um, wanted to welcome you uh, to our presentation and thank you for coming to our annual presentation on the upcoming proxy season. Uh, before we begin, got a couple of pieces of housekeeping. One is we've been told to remind you that if you want CLE credit to sign the green sheets on your tables there, put your name on it and sign it, we will uh, make sure you get the credit. And also wanted to remind people that uh, Bryn Voller's uh, um, M&A update is coming up on Thursday, January 30th uh, in this room. Uh, the semi-annual M&A updates, which are not to be missed. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I am Tim Hearn. I'm a partner in the corporate department here in Minneapolis. Joining me today are two of my partners, uh, Kimberly Anderson, a partner in the corporate department in our Seattle office. Kimberly and I are co-chairs of the Public Companies and Securities Law Compliance Practice Group here at the firm. And my other side is Shauna Anderson, uh, also a partner in the corporate department based here in Minneapolis along with me. The, uh, this year is a little different than prior years, most of the prior years, because there have been no major disclosure initiatives requiring us to add this section to the proxy or add that analysis to the proxy. We don't have that kind of signal development this year. Nevertheless, this is a time for consolidation of prior gains, so to speak. You can make improvements in disclosures previously written and anything to make the proxy statement more effective as a tool for communication with your shareholders. And to help you with that, we're going to do three things today. First thing we're going to do, and it's going to take most of the time here, is survey the current status of recent rule changes and disclosure initiatives. Uh, that you've had to respond to in past years, recent years, and that you continue to have to respond to. And that will, as I said, fill the majority of our time today. After that, we will look at a relatively short list now of still pending rulemaking actions, the things that are left over from, uh, from Dodd-Frank, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, if there's time, we're going to go over a governance matter, which, uh, although not strictly a proxy season issue, uh, it's one that has been getting a lot of attention uh, uh, from governance professionals in the last six months. So with that, I'm going to kick it off, and I start it with a review of uh, Compensation Committee independence issues. Uh, this uh, little bit of history here, uh, in June of 2012, uh, the SEC adopted uh, rules to implement Section 952 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, those rules directed the stock exchanges to establish listing standards for their compensation committees of their listed companies. They also required uh, companies to disclose their review of uh, whether there were conflicts of interest raised in connection with the engagement of compensation consultants. Uh, that, those rules were adopted in 2012. They instructed the exchanges to impose or to, to develop listing standards for their companies that would impose these requirements. In response to those rules, the exchanges last year in 2013 adopted new rules and NASDAQ actually amended theirs late in the year in December relating to the composition and authority of compensation committees. As a result of those rules, two sets of deadlines were set up, uh, one set in 2013 and one set in 2014. The 2013 deadline, July 1, which you've all already dealt with, uh, but just to re remind you, the uh, compensation committees were required to be given the authority to hire compensation consultants, independent legal counsel, and have sole responsibility for overseeing their work. Now that was, uh, this is kind of the parallel in the compensation committee world uh, to what audit committees got back in the Sox uh, era, when audit committees were given independence, given control over the, uh, the relationship with auditors and the funding, et cetera, to hire the auditors. That's what's happening here this year now with the compensation committees. Uh, they're also, issuers were also required to provide funding for compensation committees to pay these consultants. You couldn't starve your compensation committee into, into bending to your will, so to speak. Uh, and also compensation committees required to, in, in connection with engagement of compensation advisors, they had to consider factors that affected the independence of the compensation advisor. Uh, in particular, six factors that are listed in the, uh, they were listed in the SEC's rules and carried over in the exchange listing standards, six factors that have to be considered any time a compensation advisor is engaged. Uh, and finally, uh, by July 1, 2013, NYSE listed companies 
were required to have compensation committee charters that spelled all of this out, that laid this uh, expanded authority out. So that all, that's all history. That's what happened in 2013. And, and we're all hoping that you did that. Yes, yes. If, if none of that sounds familiar, then uh, talk, talk to me Talk to, <laughs> talk me to after, Jim afterwards. afterwards. Um, in 2014, uh, there is a deadline coming up, and it's, it's the earlier of uh, the first annual meeting after January 15 or October 31, 2014. So for most of you, it's going to be the annual meeting this year. Uh, and the, that deadline, by that deadline, the compensation committee must be comprised solely of directors who meet both the general and specific compensation committee independent standards. Uh, and there's more on that in just a minute. Um, for NASDAQ listed companies, some NASDAQ also has imposed now, brought itself into line with what's been standard practice, the NYSE, for a number of years. NASDAQ now requires listed companies, or as of these deadlines, will require listed companies to have a compensation committee. Up until now, the NASDAQ has allowed companies to use their board as their compensation committee. They'll have to have a separate compensation committee. Uh, they have to have a charter that lays out all of these responsibilities and expanded authority of the, of the compensation committee. And this is one thing you can make a note of. Within 30 days after the deadline, so for most of you, within 30 days after the annual meeting, you're going to need to send a certification to NASDAQ that you are in compliance with these new requirements. The certification is going to be done on a form for that purpose, which hasn't been released yet. It's supposed to come out early in 2014. I've heard the date January 15, 2014 mentioned, uh, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, it will come out. Presumably, it'll be a fairly simple form to complete. And then finally, the, the director independent standards, the compensation committee uh, standards, are first that you have to meet the general independent standards. Now, that's for purposes of, uh, I mean, the exchanges have all required that a majority of the board be independent. I mean, that's been true for a while, and there are independence requirements that you have to meet to be independent for that purpose. So obviously, all these committee members have to meet those general independent standards. What's being layered on top of that are these additional compensation committee specific independent standards, which now the members of the committee will have to meet as of uh, the deadline this year. Uh, and that, those standards break down to two factors. They are referred to as the fee factor and the affiliate factor. Uh, the fee factor is that the board has to look at sources, any sources of compensation that the director receives, including any consulting or advisory fees or whatever, they have to look at those and consider whether or not those affect independence. That's the fee factor. The affiliate factor is they need to look at each director on the comp committee and determine is that person an affiliate of the issuer, an affiliate of a subsidiary of the issuer, uh, or a, a affiliated with the subsidiary or whatever. Are there any affiliate relationships uh, with, between that director and the issuer and a subsidiary? And what you do with those two factors, the board has to take those two factors and say, okay, given the facts that I've discovered there, would that be something that would impair a director's ability to make independent judgments about the company's executive compensation? So that, it's a very subjective test, but the board has to make an affirmative determination that each compensation committee member meets that independence standard. Um, it's interesting, I mentioned that NASDAQ made a change late in the year that they, they changed their uh, requirements from the mid-year, and then in December they re made a change in the listing standards, and what they were doing was adopting these two factors, the fee factor and affiliate factor. Prior to this time, uh, they took a more objective approach, had some dollar number levels in their independence determinations. By making this change, they brought themselves into line with the NYSE, so both essentially have the same compensation committee independence requirements, uh, which makes our lives easier and, and say, <laughs> saves us from killing some brain cells. Yeah, to and, this stuff and out. NASDAQ was getting comments from people because they had a flat prohibition with respect to fees that, you know, their issuers were telling them that this was going to be difficult to comply with, and NASDAQ doesn't really need to lose any more issuers to the New York Stock Exchange. So. I think they wanted to make sure that they, right. you know, uh, we're complying and essentially uh, uh, consistent with everyone else. Right, exactly. The one other piece uh, that I'd mention is that the uh, uh, both exchange, or NYC and NASDAQ, both said that there is not a bright line at which stock ownership impairs independence. 
they, so there's no, because some people have asked, well, if you, if you own so many shares, you must not be independent. That's not the case. There's no bright line. They haven't said it absolutely has no effect, but it by itself will not uh, impair independence. And that is the review of Compensation Committee uh, independence. We're now going to go to uh, Kimberly to review the conflict minerals subject. Yeah, so while the proxy statement doesn't actually require any significant new required disclosure, for those companies that manufacture products that contain conflict minerals, this is a huge year. Um, so just a little bit of background. The SEC adopted rules regarding uh, disclosure regarding the use of conflict minerals. Conflict minerals are tungsten, tin, tantalum, and gold. In other words, the 3TG. And there was a concern because in the, uh, the DRC, in the Congo, there is an enormous level of violence um, and it is generally believed that it's fueled by conflict minerals. So effectively what it comes down to is that if you manufacture um, any product that goes into the stream of commerce, it doesn't have to be an end product, it can be you know, a component to go to something else, and if it contains any of these, and I will tell you, if it has solder in it, it contains tin. So, you know, if it contains any of these and there's no de minimis, you actually have to start, you know, doing your reasonable country of inquiry. You have to see if you can track your supply chain. This is enormously expensive. It is very time consuming. Intel started on this years ago. So um, I'm not going to spend enormous amounts of time on this uh, because if you are subject to conflict minerals, you know, you're already into it up here and the last thing you need is to actually hear it again because at this point it's one of those things where it's like, you know, fingernails on chalkboard. But um, the initial reports will be due, you know, May 31st. This will be the first year, um, and May 31st is a Saturday, so the first one's actually due on June 2nd. I don't expect that anybody is going to be filing things early, so that, you know, if you're hoping to wait and see what other people do, I'm guessing there's going to be a flurry of filings, you know, right at the end. Um, there was guidance issued in May of 2013 with respect to conflict minerals, because there was a big question as to, you know, what's a product, what's covered, um, the, the example everyone always gave was, well, is it soup or is it soup in a can? Hopefully there, is, there are no conflict minerals in the soup itself. Uh, the can is another issue. Um, and so for, particularly for companies in the food industry, this was a huge issue. At one point, I think Kraft said they had 100,000 suppliers. Can you please explain to us how we're supposed to be tracking all of our packaging? Fortunately, um, the SEC came back, answered the question. It is just soup. It is not soup in the can. So packaging was out. So that was an enormous relief to a number of people, but anyone in the electronics industry is still caught. So, and then, you know, step forward, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, don't always agree with the U.S. Chamber, but on some things, I think they're, they're, they're spot on. So they had a let a legal challenge. Um, the decision came out in June, rules were upheld. So um, the SEC was vindicated, legal challenge was filed. They actually held the oral arguments two days ago. Reportedly, the judges were highly skeptical of these rules. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with some of the conclusions. We'll see what they end up coming out. But if you are an issuer subject to these rules, do not assume that these rules are going to be overturned. You don't have time to stop working on this. And, um, it, you know, I don't know. While people have, have a number of problems with the rules, the SEC's rules really do follow pretty closely the SEC mandate. So if you're subject to conflict mineral rules, don't stop working. Um, I currently have some bets out with people, but I can't get anyone to take them because none of us actually think these rules are going to be overturned. So just assume they're going to be in place. Uh, if you are not subject to them, uh, that is uh, a time to thank uh, whatever God you thank to. <laughs> so and then let's move on to Iran. Um, so I seem to be doing all the disclosure about odd and interesting places in the world. There you go. Not to say that Iran is odd, but nonetheless, August 2012, um, there was the Iran Threat Reduction in Syria Human Rights Act of uh, 2012. So this did a number of things. One, it dramatically expanded liability. Uh, and two, what it also said is that you now have to report, not only annually, but quarterly, if you do, if your company or any of your affiliates are involved in this enumerated list of activities. It's a fairly long list, um, but even worse was the definition of, you know, you or your affiliates. Affiliate is the standard definition, so it would cover your major shareholders, your directors, your officers, 
very, very broad definition. And so, and there was really not much guidance other than the fact of, you know, use the standard affiliate definition. So companies are spending enormous amounts of money and time trying to figure out if they have any relationship to Iran. Because you have to, you know, report it, it's posted, you know, there's a specific Iran notice, it gets reported to the president. It's all, all very important. Uh, one of my clients, we actually went through, there was four lawyers on the call at various different places, me, sanctions lawyers, et cetera, and I kid you not, the entire dollar amount that we were at issue was $1.73. Just so we're clear, it's $1.73. Ultimately, we determined it was not an activity covered, <laughs> but you know, keep in mind, Dell, um, just as way, by way of example, ended up reporting the fact that an affiliate of a recently acquired sub had a software renewal with a bank, a software renewal agreement with the bank, total revenue $170. But I mean, this was, you know, it wasn't even a contract that their newly acquired sub had entered into, it was actually an affiliate of that sub. So the, uh, the disclosure that's out there is getting highly attenuated. Um, most people would say it's probably largely immaterial, but nonetheless, it is because of the broad reach of this bill. I will tell you, the SEC hates this rule. I once called him because I called him when I was, had some initial questions about it, and the first thing out of his mouth was, we didn't write this. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't responsible for this. And I said, well, you are kind of responsible. He says, yes, but we didn't write it. So they clearly didn't like it. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that you keep in mind is one of the exemptions is if you do things with the government of Iran and you have a, uh, an exemption, if you have a, a license or authorization, then you're fine and you don't need to disclose. There's another part to that rule, though, that says if you do any kind of business with any of these enumerated persons that you know, deal with weapons of mass destruction or terrorism, et cetera, you still have to disclose even if your activity falls within a specific authorization. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't do work with terrorists, and I don't do work with supporters of weapons of mass destruction. Well, a lot of the banks in Iran are on those lists. So even if you know you fall cleanly with enough specific authorization, you need to make sure that you're looking at all the different people you do work with because you may get tagged and therefore re require disclosure. Um, so there's, there's innumerable ways to screw up this disclosure, so I just want to warn you about it. Your turn. All right. It comes back to me for just a minute, and I'm going to talk about say on pay, one of our favorite topics. 2014 is the fourth year of say on pay votes. Uh, and although it's still time consuming, the approach and process has become more or less routine. In 2013, just to hit the numbers, uh, 74 companies had failed say on pay votes. And although that was an increase over 2012, uh, you have to keep in mind that in 2013, all of the smaller reporting companies first became subject to say on pay reporting. So that was hundreds and hundreds of companies that got added to the list. So actually, although there were more companies failed, the percentage of companies failing actually went down from 2012 to 2013 from 2.4 to 2.2 percent. The um, what do you do in on say on pay this year? It's really more of the same. Uh, focus once again on making your cDNA as clear and effective as you can. Uh, so that it supports the compensation policies uh, that, uh, that need to be approved in the say on pay proposal. You need to review the updated governance proposals of policies of ISS and Glass-Lewis. Uh, and we will have more on that later in the presentation, a uh, report on the updated uh, policies of those two organizations. Uh, remembering that ISS will apply heightened scrutiny to your proxy if you had a say on pay vote last year that passed with less than 70% support. So if that's the case, then you really you need to crank it up on your say on pay disclosure. Uh, the CDNA should include discussion of how results of the 2013 vote were used in determining compensation uh, this year. Uh, so you'll need to make sure that that is reflected in your CDNA discussion. You will get a comment from the SEC if it is not, and they review your disclosure. <laughs> And finally, and probably most importantly, is to engage your shareholders in discussion on your executive compensation issues. Find out what they're concerned about, if they're concerned about things, uh, and try to head things off early rather than uh, finding out during the course of the voting that you have a problem. And that hopefully the engagement of shareholders is not something you're hopefully starting now. Hopefully that's been going on for 
for a number of years now. And now we're going to go to Shauna to talk about trends in shareholder activism. So the, the two couple of trends that we're going to focus on today are around shareholder proposals and then shareholder strike suits that relate to executive comp. Uh, taking shareholder proposals first, in 2013, we saw sort of a, a modest increase in the number of shareholder proposals that were submitted, but this is in comparison to 20, 2012 when there was a pretty sharp increase. So it's, it's up a little bit, but not, not quite what we saw in 2012. Um, we gave you a couple of statistics here for S&P 500 companies. The number of proposals increased 4.6% over 2012, and it was 6% for the Russell 3000 companies. So it gives you some sense of the, the type of increase we're talking about. Um, in terms of the types of proposals that were brought, we saw a lot of um, board-related proposals. Those tend to come every year. Um, board declassification, majority voting, separation of the CEO and chair role. And kind of one aspect of it that I think we are really seeing is that a lot of the larger cap companies would see these proposals in the past and they deal with them. They either adopt majority voting or uh, declassify the board and those are taken care of. Those proposals are no longer relevant to them. So you see those proposals sort of moving their way down the market cap to the smaller and mid cap companies. So that's, um, that's part of what we're seeing. Uh, executive comp proposals really took off last year. They were up 50% over 2012, and those relate to specific pay practices. We've given you a couple of examples, um, proposals to do away with accelerated um, vesting in connection with a termination or change of control, um, doing away with supermajority voting thresholds, or instituting kind of stock retention requirements or, or um, stock ownership guidelines. Uh, board diversity was also a very popular topic. Um, both the number of proposals and the number of votes on those proposals tripled in 2013. So that's uh, kind of a big up and coming area of focus right now. Um, especially I think when you see um, boards are getting older and, and you have boards, uh, board members not retiring as much as maybe we've seen in the past. So definitely an up and coming area. Environmental and social proposals were, off, were also pretty common, um, largely dominated by political spending and lobbying proposals, but we also did see a lot of um, environmental and even human rights proposals. Uh, as far as what we would expect to see in 2014, if you guys have any um, thoughts, chime in, but I think we'll see generally more of what we saw in 2013. Um, you will always see the, the kind of the classic corporate governance proposals relating to board declassification and majority voting. As long as there are boards that are not declassified and boards that don't have majority voting standard, you'll see those. Uh, the executive comp proposals, I think, will continue to see um, probably increasing, and then the level of support probably will creep up this year. Board diversity was so um, so popular in 2013. I think we'll continue to see those in uh, in 2014. And then environmental and social proposals have been pretty steady and support keeps creeping up. So we'll, we'll probably continue to see those this year. Oh, yes, uh, we were chatting earlier. Um, I'd forwarded an, uh, a news article. I saw a news article that uh, John Shevedon, who is a, a proposal, he, he proponent and he puts out a lot of proposals. I forwarded to one of my clients because it indicated that, you know, yes, he's subject to a lawsuit to have the shareholder proposal removed. and. I sent it over with the ray line of for your amusement because they get stuff from him every year. But you know, did we want to? Did you want to speak to the fact that there now appears to be a growing trend to, you know, more than one way to try to get rid of a shareholder proponent? Yeah, this it could be a trend um, bringing a, a case in federal court instead of taking it directly to the SEC to try to try to get it get permission to take it out of your proxy. I'm not sure how efficient it will ultimately be or how successful it will be to spend money going to court when you could just you know, go to the SEC or just include it and, and deal with the consequences. So I'm not sure how successful it'll be. And I think in that article, uh, some people have come out and kind of said, I don't, I'm not sure how he's going to yeah, probably, you know, probably how, not how a winner. And yeah. You have to be willing to spend the money. Right. You have to have seriously a high level of irritation to decide that you're going to spend this money as well. And then, of course, you have the uncertainty. I mean, with the SEC, they kind of have trends as to what they're going to approve and disapprove. But it may have been they decided to, you know, take one last kick at the can if they didn't think the SEC was going to allow them to omit something. Right. So, and I think um, this was they were the argument was that he had some misleading information in his statement right. Right. Um, that would violate the securities laws. And if the SEC isn't going to take that up, then a, a court might not want to. 
going to get into it, but it could be something we see. Let's see. Moving on to executive comp strike suits, as everybody knows, we've got say on pay that's uh, mandated, and once we started seeing the advisory votes come out, even though they're you know, explicitly advisory votes, you started to see shareholder suits following them. And in the first sort of generation of cases, what you'd tend to see would be first a failed say on pay vote, and then a shareholder suit brought that generally would allege some sort of breach of fiduciary duty on the part of the directors or waste of corporate assets. Uh, and the argument would be made that because you had this negative say on pay vote, that's um, that rebuts the business judgment rule. Um, those cases tended to get dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage, so they weren't, weren't particularly successful, and you know, plaintiff's lawyers like to earn their fees, so they started reformulating a bit and coming up with what we would refer to as the second generation of cases, which involve kind of a different setup. It's a motion to enjoin the annual meeting before you've actually had it. And the allegation would be that there's some sort of inaccurate or misleading proxy disclosure. And the rationale is that you need to enjoin the meeting to give the company the time to fix the proxy, supplement it, and fix the alleged disclosure flaws. Um, these cases, I think, um, well, the next slide, it gives you an idea of the types of areas that, that these suits have focused on. I won't kind of tick through all of them. You can see them up here, but these tend to be the areas of focus when, when these suits are brought. Um, early on, I think there's a temptation to try to just get rid of the case. It's a little bit um, disconcerting to face the prospect of an enjoined annual meeting, so people like to kind of get rid of it and resolve it. So I think there was a temptation early on to settle those suits, but companies, I think, are becoming more comfortable fighting it out. And as they do that, they're becoming more and more successful. You've seen courts kind of decide that the, you know, the missing information isn't that material or that they're, you know, the remedy isn't, isn't necessary because if you, uh, if you have a plaintiff that's ultimately successful, they could just order a new vote. Uh, you don't need to enjoin the meeting, so. Um, as, as these cases kind of become less and less successful, you know, you're gonna start seeing plaintiff's lawyers reformulate again. Um, and this could be maybe a third generation of cases or maybe a, you know, the same type of second generation cases where you have a, uh, a motion to enjoin an annual meeting. But we've listed up on the next slide a few areas that, that um, we could start seeing. Um, you could have cases where it's basically an argument that there's too much pay, that a company either has, um, has exceeded their plan limits um, or that they just have excessive pay programs or even that they potentially aren't complying with 162M. And kind of the important note there is that if there is something to one of these cases, you know, this could result in a need to rescind equity, equity grants that are non-compliant. So it's something to really pay attention to. Don't forget that you have your 162M limits and you have your plan limits and, and make sure that you are tracking those. That's one thing I think to be aware of. We could also start seeing suits to kind of unbundle uh, 162M approval from the equity plan approval. Those tend to be brought now in, in a single proposal. We could see suits to unbundle those and vote separately on those. Um, suits alleging a lack of compensation consultant independence now that there's more, more focus on independence. You could see those, it's a, you know, it's a way to, you know, to get some fees. So it could be something that people start picking on. Yeah, which I find fascinating because when you look at the rules, they, are very, they go out of their way. They are very clear that says, the SEC said, you don't have to use somebody who's independent. You have to look at it. Right. But you are not bound in any way, shape, or form to use somebody who's independent. So I'm not saying that you, know, you can always bring a lawsuit. I just, uh, I'm just kind of amused that I'm hoping that that doesn't actually turn out to be a correct And we will talk in a minute prediction. about things you can do to try to ward off that type of suit just for that, for that particular reason. Um, in future years, if and when we see the CEO pay ratio rules finalized, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, we could start to see suits alleging you know, bad disclosure in that area. And with the rules being so simple yet so complex, um, there, there are probably a lot of areas that you could pick on. And I, and I know that a number of companies are concerned about the risk of strike suits on, on the basis of those rules. So um, in a few years, we may be talking about this again. Um, in terms of advanced planning, there are a number of things that you can do to try to ward off these types of suits. 
Um, they, may, they may again always be broad, but you can try to minimize the areas of, um, of focus. The biggest is just to, to you know, go about your executive comp process in a very kind of thorough and well-informed, complete way. When you make comp decisions, make sure that they're defensible. It seems like it's a no-brainer, but just make sure that it is defensible, that there's a reason given, and that the reason is right for your company in light of how your business is performing or in light of how your business operates. Um, reviewing plan terms with counsel and comp consultants is becoming, I think, more and more critical. Uh, you need to make sure that, that the parameters of the plan and the aspects of the plan are kind of consistent with your committee policy, consistent with emerging best practices. You don't want to be an outlier because that'll just you know shine a spotlight on you. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're complying with corporate and tax laws, making sure that there isn't anything there that, that could subject you to, um, to challenge. And then last, you kind of be aware that your litigation record starts with that first meeting of the year. So even if you're in the initial stages of proxy planning or even in structuring a, a pay plan, uh, just remember that that is going to be part of the record. It's not. Um, it's not when you just officially have have your proxy draft in in hand, or when you've got the uh, the structure all set up. There is no substitute for careful compliance with the rules. We all know that there are sometimes gray areas or uh, things you can focus on or just try to leave out. But you know, carefully complying with the disclosure rules is the best. Uh, best way to ward off this type of suit and thinking ahead to areas that might open you up to challenge is, is something that we all can do. Um, it's usually kind of well known what people are picking on, so you look, look to those areas and make sure that you're cutting off as much as you can through your disclosure. And if you think that litigation risk is significant, um, we think it's always a good idea to call Dorsey and have our very experienced trial attorneys <laughs> take a look at your disclosure. Um, that's done very commonly um, in the M&A context when you have merger proxies. They, they take a look at them and they, they tell you what they think is going, you know, potentially going to be a problem. So that can be carried over into the annual meeting context as well if you think there's some risk. So we're going to move on now to uh, policy updates from the proxy advisory firms. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot this year that has changed that's of significance. ISS and Glass-Lewis both kind of modestly updated their policies for this proxy season. And the two major areas were board responsiveness to a shareholder vote and then um, from ISS at least uh, the, the way that they're calculating or measuring pay for performance. So we'll start off with board responsiveness. Uh, from ISS, the policy is now that if you have a shareholder proposal that receives a majority of votes cast in a single year, they will review for board responsiveness. And this is in contrast to the prior year or two um, during which they would look at it if you had um, a majority of vote cast support for a shareholder proposal in two out of the prior three years. So you'd look back at the three years and you need to have the majority of votes cast in two of them. Or if in a single year you have a majority of the outstanding shares, then they would look at it. So a bit of a change there. In terms of what they're actually recommending on, on director elections, that's still going to be on a fact-specific case-by-case basis, but they are giving a little bit more discretion to analysts in, in recommending a withhold or against vote for uh, directors when there is majority support received. Um, essentially, this is going to be a comply or explain policy, so if you don't completely implement a shareholder proposal. You need to very clearly and fully explain why you didn't or else you risk having withholder against votes for your directors the next year. Uh, Glass-Lewis was a little bit narrower in, in its update. Um, if a shareholder proposal seeking board declassification receives majority support, then um, the board, if they don't implement that proposal, Glass-Lewis will consider withhold or against votes for all nominees that served through the previous year, and that's regardless of what committees they serve on, so something also to be aware of. Um, ISS's 2014 policy updates also included a change in how they're measuring pay for performance. So they, when they come up with their initial recommendation for say on pay votes, they look at a number of different screens, and the primary one they look at is this RDA, relative degree of alignment. Uh, they've changed the way they're looking at that screen. Last year, the way they calculated it was based on the difference between the company's total shareholder return and the CEO's total pay rank within a pay group over the last one-year period and three-year period, and they would weight it 
40 and 60 percent respectively. So the change for this year is that they're only going to be looking at the three-year period. And the rationale for that change is that there was a, a sense that there was too much focus on the last year because it was included in both the one and three-year measures and that this change will sort of smooth out how they're measuring performance. Um, the other side of it, I guess, is that you, you won't receive as much credit for a recent change because it's only going to be taken into account in that three-year period as opposed to both the three and one as it was last year. All right. Thank you, Shauna. And now we're going to go into a quick uh, set of drafting considerations for SEC filings. Um, this is just kind of a smorgasbord of, uh, of things you might want to think about in doing your filings. Uh, layout and organizational changes to your proxy. Uh, as I said, this is kind of a year to consolidate and improve what you've already got uh, since you don't have uh, major initiatives to respond to. Uh, consider using a summary at the front of the proxy statement. Consider using a Q&A if you haven't already got one at the front of the proxy statement. Additional graphs and charts can be useful uh, for your compensation disclosure. Uh, if you've had a majority supported shareholder proposal which is not fully implemented, then you need to explain that rationale. That's something to keep in mind. Um, seeking approval of equity plans, uh, consider trying to uh, 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 counter the shareholder strike suits we were just talking about, uh, head them off at the pass by putting in some of the things that strike suits look for, like burn rate, dilution, peer group comparisons, and that sort of thing. Um, Non-GAAP measures are a particular focus of the SEC right now. Uh, they have formed a, the SEC Financial Reporting and Audit Task Force, uh, which they have dubbed the, I assume they could pronounce it fraud, not fraud, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a strange acronym. At any rate, uh, the Fraud Task, task Force um, uh, focused on non-GAAP measures. Uh, DNO questionnaire should be updated, uh, and you've probably already done this, uh, to include inquiries regarding uh, compensation committee independence and uh, compensation consultants, as well as any Iranian-related activities to the extent they can be discovered through your questionnaires. Segment reporting is also a focus. This is something that the SEC was uh, not focused on for years and years, but has in the last couple of years started to focus on it again. So if you are a, have a segmented reporting business, uh, you should definitely have review that with your accountants. And finally, this year, as every year, you should review your risk factors to determine if they're complete and cover all the risks that, uh, that you're subject to today. Uh, so just kind of a list of, of things to think about. And that is the last uh, segment in the first part of our talk. Now we're going to go into the few things that are kind of hanging out there, haven't been completed or haven't been proposed. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, Kimberly, you're going to start. Yes. So um, I'm first. Uh, I was. This is a, a rule that was proposed, government payments for resource extraction issuers. They were going to have to report the kinds of payments that they made to foreign governments, et cetera. This was subject to a legal challenge, and I'm delighted to say it was vacated. Um, I didn't think it was a very well-written rule and would have put companies that are re reporting companies at a significant competitive disadvantage. Fortunately, the court agreed. The SEC did not appeal it. They have yet to actually repropose the rules. They, it, they will eventually come out. People will be subject to it. But everyone has anticipated that the next set of rules will be uh, dramatically uh, less onerous. And I think we shift to Shauna on Dodd-Frank. Yeah, the, there are a number of areas of rulemaking that we have yet to see anything on. And I think in the past few years, we keep saying it's going to be this year, it's going to be this year, it's going to be this year. I don't think we're saying that anymore. It's anyone's guess when these rules will act actually come out. Uh, the ones of, of primary interest, I think, to this group are, are the, uh, the governance area ones, disclosure rules on the, the pay for performance relationship. Those have not come out. Um, rules mandating a clawback policy, those have not come out. And then rules requiring disclosure of whether you have a, uh, an anti-hedging policy for directors and executive officers, those also have not come out. A number of our companies, uh, our clients, have, um, have gone ahead and either adopted one or both of the clawback and anti-hedging policies, and they already disclose in, in their proxy or 10K whether or not they have them. So in some ways, people are kind of moving ahead. Um, it's always possible that once the final rules are proposed, there will be a need to, to tweak the policy or revisit what you've, what you've got as your standard disclosure. But until we see the rules, we just won't know. 
And we go back to Kimberly for our favorite topic. Ugh, <laughs> I hate this rule. All right, so this is the CEO pay ratio rule. These are the proposed rules. And um, so essentially what this mandates, it's uh, the, that there, it's gonna be a ratio that you will have to disclose of the CEO's total compensation to the median annual compensation of all employees other than the CEO of an issuer. So um, on its face, well, it's a very short rule, um, and then you actually have to apply it. Uh, so far, I believe there's over 125,000 comment letters. Um, the, it was adopted in September. Comments were due uh, by December 2nd, but comments are still coming in. So I don't, and I don't think they've been, I don't think the comments have been, comment period's been extended, but nonetheless, people are still putting them in. like the rule, or this is a good idea, but the rule is not good, or this whole thing is bad? Because well, it seems like the public definitely is interested in the idea that, you know, there's all these problems and 1% or whatever, and that one thing sometimes people grasp is, gee, the people at the top shouldn't be paid so much, but then what do you do about it? Right. There is, um, when you look at the comment letter, it's, and I, I don't actually have them all broken out, but there's a set of form letters, A through H, of, you know, you know, Yes, I'm in favor of it. No, not in favor of it. Most of those are, are crafted toward the, you know, yes, I support it. Um, but the ones that actually have real substance are not the form letters. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, the Society for Corporate Governance and uh, uh, Professionals came out with a very long, detailed proposal, a number of law firms have as well, to really go through the practical impact. Um, in fact, the society said, look, we get that this is mandated. We understand that there is going to be some disclosure but let's see if we can actually craft this rule in a way that you won't, you know, either dramatically increase our costs, decrease our ability to actually comply with the rule. Let's, let's see if we can, we accept the fact that we're gonna be subject to it. So now let's see if we can make it workable. Um, so why don't we kind of go through um, what it says and I'll kind of tell you some of the, because these are proposed rules, I'll sort of, you know, go through some of the challenges as, as we go through these and some of the suggestions. Um, but. I'm expecting these are not going to be really finalized anytime soon, given the volume of comments. Um, and, you know, the SEC, you know, has gotten slammed on a number of points, so I think they're going to try to make this workable. And they've gotten a number of very uh, useful industry commentary. So essentially what it comes down to is um, – we're not even gonna go into compliance dates because that's completely up in the air. But let's just chat about, so who are the employees that are gonna have to be included? Here's the fascinating part is the SEC took literally when the, um, uh, the law came out when it said all employees, so it covers everything. It covers full-time, part-time, seasonal, temporary workers, people outside the United States, um, anybody who's employed as of the last day of the year, uh, and then, but independent contractors aren't covered because of course they're not your employees, but so it covers everyone. So if you are a company that has an enormous contingent of either part-time workers, persons in a, um, uh, a foreign country where wages are typically much lower, it's going to skew your results and, that's, and that is a concern, particularly if you have a lot of part-time or seasonal workers. So, and then, so what you, the whole point of this is what you do is you, Here's your, you have a, a big group of all your employees. And then, so you try to figure out kind of like, you know, what you pay everybody. And then you find the median employee. And he doesn't act, he or she doesn't actually have to be a real employee. Let's, let's be clear. It's, they can be you know, a hypothetical employee. It's like, well, this hypothetical employee would make X amount of money. Um, it could be someone who's subject to a collective bargaining agreement. It could be someone in another country. But it's the median, excluding the CEO. So... And you can figure out however you want to do to figure out the median employee. You have to come up, it has to be reasonable because you're going to have to describe it, and you have to cons consistently apply your methodology. So now this just in and of itself right here creates huge amounts of problems for companies. Most of them have compensation systems, especially multinational companies. You know, the compensation systems, generally speaking, aren't necessarily always set up to track compensation the way you would in the United States. Some countries have privacy issue problems so that you may not actually be able to utilize this or have to go through hoops in order to, you know, get some of the data. So, um, you know, just actually 
tr and then in some countries the question is, well, you know, gee, I've got a whole bunch of guys over here in a joint venture. Are they independent contractors? Are they employees, et cetera? So you have to make that determination as well. So there are, you know, huge numbers of determinations that have to be made before you can even come up with your list and then actually trying to figure out what's in the list. So, um, you know, again, you, there is flexibility to come up with a reasonable methodology, but again, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to do and extraordinarily expensive. So uh, then you need to figure out, you know, so some of these challenges are, um, oh, for total compensation, um, you can annualize for permanent employees. So if it's a new hire who only worked for a month, you can annualize them because you have to count them because if they were employed at the end of the year, you can annualize them, but you can't make COLA adjustments, you can't make adjustments for, you know, part-time workers and so on. So again, because there's a lot of adjustments you're not permitted to make, um, there is, it, it becomes, nonsensical is the word that comes to mind, but that's probably not an appropriate word to use with an SEC rule. So let's just say it may be, you know, you're going to have a lot of apples to oranges, comparisons between companies because you're going to have, you know, people with their employees in different places doing different things, either a lot of seasonal workers or against an industry where most people are in the United States and much more highly paid. Um, so it could lead to a result where uh, someone who is, say, in the financial industry, especially if they have a lot of people in the United States, the CEO ratio would be much lower than possibly a CEO who's paid in, you know, significantly less, but because they have a lot of workers outside the United States or in different pay areas or a lot of seasonal workers, uh, it will skew some of these results. And uh, so this is leading to what can only be described as an incredible amount of angst. So, uh, and another one of the concerns is that right now, this would be considered filed information. You're subject to liability for this information, which is very hard because now you've got um, you have people certifying this to information, you're subject to liability, and there are so many assumptions that go into this, and there are so many uncertainties involved that companies are very concerned that they are, you know, going to be, even if they do their best to comply with this, they are subjecting themselves to, you know, significant potential liability because this will be a very high-profile disclosure. People are going to look at this, they're going to write about it, people will be vilified for it. You will have some CEOs who go to their board and say, why is my ratio not higher? Why am I paid so much less than Bob? Um, there are, it is the, this is the law of unintended consequences. So uh, it will be curious to see how it comes out. I fully expect that there will be a number of changes. I'm willing to put money on the fact that this will not be adopted this year, and it's only January, just because, because of the fallout. And if it is adopted, the U.S. Chamber will file a lawsuit within six to eight weeks. That's my guess. I, I, I think you're right in both of those. Uh, I mean, I, I think there may be a reproposal coming out. Yeah. But it's that's months and months away. Yeah. So it's this is a this is a long-term project. Um, I think we go now to the last topic, which is uh, this governance matter, which, as I said earlier, was not strictly a proxy season matter but one that governance professionals have been spending a lot of time on in the last six months, and that's forum selection bylaws. Um, what is a forum selection bylaw first? I mean, it's a, it's a corporate bylaw that limits the jurisdictions in which shareholders can bring suit against the corporation. Now, understand, this is, this is shareholder lawsuits, so it's derivative lawsuits, fiduciary duty lawsuits, violation of corporate statute, uh, um, internal affairs doctrine, lawsuits. It's not slip and fall cases. It's not contract case, not third party contract cases. The, this is not trying to limit jurisdiction or, or forum to, for those kind of suits. It's shareholder lawsuits. So it's suits involving the internal affairs of the corporation. Uh, when these bylaws are adopted, what do they do? They specify the jurisdiction in which those kind of suits can be brought. Generally, it's either the jurisdiction of incorporation, Delaware, Minnesota, whatever state, or it's the jurisdiction in which the headquarters is located. Um, it generally, you can't select a jurisdiction without significant ties to the corporation. That's why it tends to be one of those two. And generally, the, uh, the forum selection can be waived by the corporation by written consent. Um, where do these forum selection bylaws come from? They've sprung up recently because of the growth of multi-jurisdictional litigation. I mean, what's happening is issuers are finding themselves being sued in multiple jurisdictions and multiple courts in multiple jurisdictions 
uh, with uh, companies that have, have multi-state operations can be sued in any state where they have a significant operation. They, the nexus could be found. Uh, so it's very expensive to maintain multi-jurisdictional litigation. Listed some of the costs on the, on the slide here. Uh, and you can risk the inconsistent results as well where you get courts ruling on the same set of facts but different ways. Uh, and then just the whole, the, the whole failure to maximize judicial uh, resources. Um, so the, the, the forum selection bylaws are an attempt by companies to protect themselves against this multi-jurisdictional litigation. The, uh, the adoption of forum selection bylaws, generally they are adopted unilaterally by the board in the bylaws. The bylaws are amended to provide that these kind of lawsuits can only be filed in whatever forum is selected. Uh, that's how most of them are adopted. They can be adopted by the board and then approved by the shareholders, sent to the shareholders for approval. Uh, in some cases, the board has proposed them to shareholders, not adopted them, but proposed them and let the shareholders adopt them. Um, the, by, as I said, by far the most common is the unilateral adoption by the board in the bylaws. Uh, they can, just a side note, they can also be put in the charter. That clearly requires shareholder approval to amend the charter. Uh, but generally, when they end up in the charter, it's because there's some uh, fundamental transaction or event going on, like an IPO or a reorganization or something, so that the articles are already being uh, manhandled, so to speak, uh, in that process. The, uh, the reaction uh, to forum selection bylaws, um, shareholders have filed suit against uh, these kind of bylaws because they're obviously limiting the strategic uh, options of the plaintiffs. Uh, to file uh, multi-jurisdictional litigation. Um, their pressure has been put on board to voluntarily repeal uh, and legal actions have been filed. And what, what has brought this to the fore is that most recently there were 12 lawsuits filed against corporations that had unilaterally adopted these bylaws. 10 of the companies that adopted those bylaws decided to repeal them voluntarily, but two corporations fought uh, the plaintiffs uh, and that was Chevron and FedEx. Uh, and in the case that's noted on this slide, uh, the uh, Chancellor Strine in the Delaware Chancery Court held that the bylaw was enforceable, which was a somewhat unexpected result. Uh, now he found they were being, the, the, the plaintiffs were claiming that the bylaws were facially invalid, that they just couldn't, they couldn't do that. The board didn't have the power to do that. And what Strine found was that they were valid on a contractual and a statutory basis. That is, from a contractual basis, he said, the bylaws can be amended that way. The bylaws are part of the contract between the corporation and its shareholders. And the bylaws can specific, the, the, the board has the ability to amend the bylaws. They're contractually valid. Statutorily valid, he looked at the Delaware statute and said, well, the statute says the bylaws can govern these sorts of matters, and one of them is and I haven't got the language in front of me, but it was very specific language that would seem to encompass the ability to say we can curtail the rights of shareholders in this sort of way. So the, the Strine, he didn't say that everyone would be valid in every case, but just you can't say across the board they are, they are facially invalid. Contractually and statutorily, they're valid. This was, uh, this was a big win for uh, Chevron and, and FedEx. Uh, and since that court case has come down, many Delaware corporations, the last count I saw, and this was back in uh, September, the last count I saw was about 62 had adopted. A lot of uh, Fortune 500 companies had adopted uh, these, uh, these bylaws. Now, it's mainly Delaware corporations, and that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road on this issue, and that's where I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit because it gets very complicated. The... Um, our, our recommendation in terms of these bylaws is for a Delaware corporation, uh, Delaware corporation, especially one headquartered in a different state, it probably at this point makes sense to go ahead and adopt the bylaw. Uh, I mean, you may get some pushback from your shareholders and you have to take that into account what's the nature of your shareholder base. Uh, but with this case, it seems that the enforceability of these, of these, of these bylaws is uh, at least uh, facially established and hopefully will sur survive in, in the lawsuit. Um, that's for Delaware corporations, and it's particularly useful for, uh, good for Delaware because of that language in the Delaware statute that supports the idea of a bylaw that places this kind of limit on shareholder lawsuits. Minnesota corporations, it's, it's more, much more uncertain because that language does not appear in the Minnesota statute. Minnesota statute has different language which could be construed, a court could construe it and say, 
Well, that we will we will interpret that the same way that Delaware interpreted their language, and so it's facially valid. But on the other hand, uh, Minnesota court could use the different language in Minnesota to say, well, we're distinguishing ourselves from Delaware. Yeah, Delaware has that language. We've got this language. You can't do that in Minnesota. So it's not as clear to us that they're going to succeed in Minnesota for Minnesota uh, incorporated organizations. Uh, and then you've got to balance the, the risk then that it, it's not upheld, but you create all this angst and fury among your shareholders uh, because there are plaintiffs who will object strenuously to the adoption of this kind of bylaw. So, I'm, I mean, these kind of, and actually the most interesting thing of all of the forum selection bylaws are the uh, litigation strategy pieces, trying to figure out in what way and what kind of litigation this kind of bylaw is useful. I'm not a litigator. I sat on a panel with one of our litigators, and it was fascinating hearing him respond to the questions because there's all sorts of strategy in there that, uh, that I, the corporate professional, wasn't, uh, wasn't aware of. At any rate, we're happy to talk to you at any time about these bylaws if you're interested. Uh, I would get a litigator involved, and we could analyze your situation. But, uh, but it is a topic that is uh, front of mind for most corporate governance professionals. And that... Why don't we at least note the one last sure, thing? Sure, go ahead. Um, it, it's not in the slides. It's on the back page of the memo, is that the PCAOB came out with guidance in October um, geared toward they had done a based on observations over the last three years with respect to audits of internal controls, and they actually had some advice at the very end of the report for audit committees. So if you are actually, if, if uh, your audit committees are going through an internal control audit, the PCAOB said, you know, you may want to tell them to discuss the following points with the auditors, because there were some areas that uh, the PCAOB said, you know, we have some concerns here. We're not sure necessarily that people did, you know, X, Y, and Z. So um, all of those bullet points are on the back page um, in case you want to provide that information to your auditors. The PCAOB, it came out on October 23rd or 24th of this year. So it's also very easy to find, and we can give that report to you in case your audit committee wants to see it. But so that was um, uh, that was one last point that we uh, we were able to get it in under the hour, which is it just didn't make it into the slides. And that's the end of our presentation for this year. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.